This is the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Jesus House Bariga, is abiding place. We are situated at number 30, Asani Street, close to Elijah bus stop, Bariga, Lagos State, Nigeria. You are welcome to join any of our services, Tuesday Digging Deep by 6.30pm, Thursday Faith Clinic also by 6.30pm, and on Sunday by 7.30am or 9am. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on all our social media accounts on Facebook, RCCG Jesus House Barriga, on Instagram at RCCG Jesus House Barriga. Come expectant and you'll be sure to share a testimony. Welcome to tonight's Digging Deep service. Again, coming to you from the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Area 19 Headquarters, Lagos Province, Province 44, situated at Bariga, Lagos. It's my pleasure to again uh, be able to bring you this Bible study service, the Word of Life. And I may, may I ask that we bow our heads as we just bless the name of the Lord and worship Him, adore Him, magnify Him, exalt Him for His God. The last time I checked, he remained the commander of the universe. He remains the one whose word is yes and amen, whose word is life, whose word is power, whose word is authority. The last time I checked, he remains the one who can do and who can undo, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, the restrainer of evil, the one who can kill and the one who can make alive, awesome Jehovah, mighty God. We exalt your holy name, Daddy. In Jesus' mighty name, we have worshipped. Be exalted, O Lord, above all heavens. Be exalted, O Lord, above all heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Be exalted, O Lord, above all heavens. Be thou exalted, O Lord, above all heavens, let thy glory be above all the earth. Let thy glory be above all the earth. The glorious Father, the commander in chief of the universe the one who can do, the one who can undo, the one who can kill, the one who maketh our life. Glory be to your mighty name. Thank you for the salvation of our souls and thank you for the nations of the world. Thank you for the leadership of our mission, the Redeemed Christian Church of God. Thank you for our homes. Thank you for the opportunity of this Bible study again at your feet. Thank you for the past Bible studies and your revelation that you brought our way. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Lord, tonight, please manifest your presence, manifest your power, fill us with your wisdom, equip us, O Lord, with the light of your word, empower us, O Lord, to do the impossible. And in all of it, let your name alone be magnified. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Once again, you're welcome. Tonight uh, will be... Or the topic we'll be looking at tonight is beyond reasonable doubt. Beyond reasonable doubt. And our text will be taken from the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. And I'll read for us from the King James Version of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 
May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. This text is what we'll try to dig deep into in our Bible study tonight. That is, we'll try to unravel the text and uh, see what God means by it or what revelation we can get out of it. Now, the text says, come, now, let us reason together. So here we see an invitation from God because he's the one who is speaking. Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So here he's promising something. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's promising that we can move from one extreme to the other extreme. From one extreme of possibility to the other, uh, uh, I mean, from one extreme of impossibility to the other extreme of possibility. From one extreme of failure to the other extreme of success. So, man indeed has the ability to reason. Because he has been created with the faculties to do so. And how does, how, uh, uh, does this faculty work? It works by recording experiences and stitching them together to determine what is good or bad, reasonable or unreasonable. So man has the ability to reason. He's been created with those faculties. He does so by acquiring experiences. From when a man is born, he begins to acquire experiences. The experiences you gather in life is what determines how you reason because those are the experiences you will stitch together at any point in time, at any given point in time. You will stitch those experiences together to determine what you will do, what your thoughts, what your actions, what your reasoning will be at any point in time. For example, um, if you have never experienced fire, the, the, the temperature of fire, the heat of fire on your, on your skin and the damage it does to the skin. Uh, when, when you see fire, you, 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 at, at a later age in life, you've not experienced it. When you see fire, you will not interpret it the same way someone that has experienced it would interpret it. You will not reason like the one who has experienced it. So, uh, that, that's an, a mundane example of what I'm trying to say, that our, our, uh, uh, we are designed with those faculties to gather experiences and then stitch them together. Our brain is so wired that we can stitch together those experiences so fast and then determine by those what is good or what is bad, what is right or what is wrong, what is reasonable or what is unreasonable. Now, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18, elucidates it the more by saying, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. So here, Scripture is saying, or God is saying, I know you're wired to uh, use your experiences. The former things, the things of old, those are things you rely on. And he's saying, remember them not. So it means he has created us with the ability and capacity to remember them and use them. Now, because man is where this way, doubt exists in the heart of natural man. The heart of natural man, that doubt exists in it. Why? Because man's knowledge is limited. Our knowledge is limited to what we have experienced. That's how limited man's knowledge is. It's mostly to his experiences. Man also, another reason uh, doubt exists in the heart of man is because man has no control over the events of his life. Man has no control over the events of his life. Therefore, man is plagued with this known limitation of reasoning. We, we, we can't, we don't have control over our life. So it's a plague. Uh, of it's a, it's a, this plague is uh, 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 that of limitation in reasoning. Our reasoning cannot go beyond our experiences. 
and our imagination, uh, our imagination at times just oversteps the bounds of our experiences. But then again, the foundation of our imagination is usually our experiences because it's what we've experienced that you start imagining that this could do better or be better or be in such a way. So your imagination goes uh, uh, ahead of your experiences. But then again, there's still that limitation there. And uh, that limitation is also uh, seen or expressed or made manifest in the fact that we make plans, but we cannot guarantee how they will pan out at the end. We can imagine, but we cannot guarantee how it will all end up. Now, one thing we need to note on the backdrop of all of this that uh, you've heard so far is that faith cannot stand where there is doubt. Faith cannot stand where there is doubt. How then can man exercise faith in the face of the natural occurrence of doubt in him? God's word says that without faith, no one can please God. It means we have to exercise faith. How can we then exercise faith in the face or on the backdrop of the natural occurrence of doubt in man? Remember I said that doubt exists in man's heart because of man's limited experiences, limited knowledge, and limited control to the issues and things of life. So how, how do we deal with this issue of faith? Now, that's where it becomes interesting, the text that we read from uh, Isaiah 1.18. So God has given us an invitation in that text, saying, come now and let's reason together. And there you will see that what is otherwise doubtful and impossible in man's experience is promised to be true and possible. So that invitation has a promise. The promise there says that even though your sins may be as red as crimson, I shall make them as white as snow. So from one extreme, which is the extreme of doubt, to the extreme of to the other extreme of faith. So God has promised that, that when we reason together, then you will begin to see that your reasoning that has limitations, that is reasonable doubt, that your reasoning can go beyond that reasonable doubt. Now, what does it mean to reason together with God? Because this invitation is a great invitation and that's what God is trying to expose or reveal to us today that this invitation is very is a grand invitation. By this invitation, you can achieve a lot. So what does it mean to reason together with God? So that, let's pay attention as we take this right together. We have often heard of the phrase, beyond reasonable doubt. We've heard of that phrase. Man uses it often, beyond reasonable doubt especially in our law courts as cases are argued we keep hearing beyond reasonable doubt now this phrase suggests that for any given matter to be acceptable as legally correct or as fair justice the facts must be such that in the mind of any man capable of reasoning correctly in the mind of any reasonable man any man capable of reasoning correctly that doubt will not be provoked thereof. That's what beyond reasonable doubt means. That whatever it is you're presenting, that in the mind of any correctly reasoning man, that doubt will not be provoked. That is, within the ambit, within the scope, within the limitations or boundaries of that man's experience, or majority of man's experience, that doubt will not be provoked. That's what that phrase means. Now, still talking about that phrase, let's remember that there are limitations to that, to what I've said above, that beyond reasonable doubt, as used by man, especially in our law courts, suggests that for any given matter to be acceptable as legally correct or as fair justice, the facts thereof must be such that in the mind of any reasonable, uh, in the mind of any, capable, in any man capable of reasoning correctly, that doubt is not provoked. 
However, there are limitations to the above because we've seen judgments determined in court after wonderful arguments and putting things beyond reasonable doubt. We have seen arguments in court and judgments upturned either several years later with provision of new facts that come into uh, the light or by some uh, or, or in appeal by some technicality disqualifying what may have been considered as reasonable and beyond doubt. So that simply means that man knows only in part. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9 elucidates that, that man knows only in part. That 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 9 says, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So man knows in part. It's only what you know that you consider reasonable and beyond doubt at every point in time. Now, the good news is this. Remember, we are talking about uh, uh, what does it mean to reason together with God. So the good news is this, that Jehovah, Elohim, Adonai, these are all names of God, which uh, uh, mean that uh, 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 he is the only true God, he is unlimited in knowledge, and so on and so forth. Elohim, El Shaddai, Adonai, and all of that. He's, limited, he's unlimited in ability. And his reasoning is the very command of all that exists in creation and is unsearchable. So, th this is the good news. That when God says, come let us reason together, what it means is that the one who is unlimited in knowledge, unlimited in ability, and all of that, the one by whom reasoning and whose very command out of that reasoning brought about creation, all that we know as creation today came from his reasoning and from his command from that reasoning, and it is unsearchable because if you look at all of nature, even scientists up till date are discovering new things out uh, uh, all in this nature, out of this creation that God made. And he can do and he can undo. So this same God is the one who has invited you to come and reason together. In him there are no limitations. Remember in mind there are limitations, but in God there are no limitations. With man... This is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, it is without doubt that God reigns supreme above all things, and that he has a proven historical record of repeating his success stories over and over again. From generation to generation, he remains God, he's unchangeable, he remains the same. Hebrews 13, 8, Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same God yesterday and today. And forever, he changed not. He changed not. So this same God who is supreme above all creation, he has successes of the past historically. I mean, his history. If you look at the record, his record historically, he has great successes. And then he keeps repeat, repeating those successes from generation to generation, from year to year. And I will just take you through some of this, just in case you uh, are doubting that. Job chapter 5 verse 9, Job chapter 5 verse 9 says, Which do it great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. You cannot count the marvelous things that God has done. So take creation for example. He, he, he created all things. Look at the creation account in Genesis. But that's marvelous, wonderful, excellent. Look at the balance of nature, the continuity of nature, the restraining of evil and all by God. Look at the master plan to bring salvation to man and reconciliation. Satan never knew that nailing Jesus to the cross would give permanent victory to uh, uh, the children of God. If he knew, he wouldn't have nailed Christ to the cross. And on and on and on. Psalm 145 verse 3, Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. When you say unsearchable, it is unlimited. It's unlimited. It's so deep, so wide, so high that you, you can't fathom it. You can't know all of it. Psalm 8 verse 1, Psalm 8 verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, 
How excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has said the glory, who has said thy glory above the heavens. His name is excellent. When you talk about the names of God, I took a topic on the names of God, one Bible study like that, the names of God. His names are names that man has given him based on experiences. So you find that, that when you mention some of these his names, it's simply expressing his marvelous and glorious works. Romans chapter 11 verse 3, Romans chapter 11 verse 3 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Again, that's a scoop of his knowledge, of his uh, power, of his wisdom, of his reasoning, uh, and, all. We, and it's, a, it's an unlimited scoop. Exodus chapter 18 verse 11. Exodus chapter 18 verse 11 says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods, for in the, thi for in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So he's taller than the tallest, bigger than the biggest, greater than the greatest, mightier than the mightiest, and so on and so forth. Richer than the richest. So which God or power or authority or science is that? When you put them before God, he's greater than all of them. Any help man will seek from whatever quarters. When you go to God, you find out that the help you get there is so much higher, far above that which you will get from any quarters, whether it be science, whether it be uh, uh, occultic powers and all. For example, in science, it gets to a point where they tell you, oh, for example, a, 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 someone with cancer, a cancer patient, they just tell you it's terminal, and, and they say, just wait for your time to pass on in peace. But when you bring that before God, God says, oh, there is, I can make new body parts, I can cure this person. And we see examples in scripture and even in modern day testimonies that we have heard. So you see, where science says, oh, I, I think this is what it is finitely by science and this I will end. God will say, no, 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 with me it is different. I'm far above the sta standards of science and power of science and I can do differently and greater. So, uh, uh, all that uh, uh, we've read so far from Scripture is just to, uh, uh, you know, show us uh, uh, that this God is indeed unlimited in knowledge, in power, in wisdom, and so on and so forth. First uh, Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse twenty-five. Maybe I'll take that one as the last. I have quite a, a lot that I can read out to you, but let's say First Chronicles chapter sixteen, verse twenty-five. Just to uh, cap it off. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He also is to be feared above all God. So there is no one above him. He is the highest. He is the one to be feared in all situations. So this great God is our God. Do you know that this great God is our God? And he has called us, this same great God, unlimited in knowledge and wisdom, unsearchable in all ways. His works are marvelous and all. He is the one that has called us by way of that text in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 that we read, saying, come, let us reason together. He's the one that has invited us. You need, therefore, to prepare yourself to come to him and reason beyond the reasonable doubt. Reason beyond your own reasoning ability. Reason beyond your experiences, because your experiences are limited. What a wonderful and great invitation. So, how can one attain this feat reasonably? How can we reasonably attain this feat of coming to this great God? Mere mortals like us with great limitations. How can we come to this great unlimited God to reason together? I mean, how are we going to reason with him? Well, very simple. Very, very simple. Let me tell you how simple it is. Number one, observe how lawyers argue their case in court before a judge. There's a lot to learn from it. If a lawyer comes unprepared, he will make a bad case. But if he comes prepared, then he has a good chance to make a good case. So let's analyze the details of how lawyers argue their cases uh, before judges in court. Let, let, let's just analyze the details a bit, just a little bit, so that we can take something out of it uh, and all. And then we can conclude, because that's what God has said. Come, let us reason together. Remember that he's the judge of all. 
So you come before him. Remember that Christ is our advocate. So we, we, we have a counselor in Christ. We have, a, we have counsel in Christ also. So let, let's just analyze that uh, lawyer judge uh, case arguing scenario because I think that's a model God wants us to use to dig deep into this world to learn just a few things. So the first thing we need to note in that scenario is that the lawyer must first be qualified to appear in court. To be a lawyer, to appear in court, you must first be qualified. You must learn the rudiments of it. You must learn the protocols. You must be qualified. You must be registered to appear before God. You must be registered to be able to be admitted into that chamber, into that courtroom. So John chapter 1 verse 12, John chapter 1 verse 12 says that as many as have received Jesus, those are the ones qualified to uh, appear before him as sons. So you want to appear before God to reason with him, to move from one extreme of impossibility to the other extreme of possibility, from one extreme of difficulty to the other extreme of ease, from one extreme of failure to the other extreme of success. Then you need to have Jesus. You need to have Jesus. So do you have Jesus? You must have him. Because you must be called to bear to come before a judge. Here you must have Jesus before you can answer that call in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. To come and reason with God. You must. So the second thing we can learn from that scenario of a lawyer before a judge arguing a case or reasoning out a case is that the lawyer enters the court bowing in reverence to the judge. A lawyer enters to the court and he calls the judge my lord and he bows. He takes a bow before the judge. And that's why Psalm 100 verse 4, Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter God's gates with praise and his courts with reverence. Enter his courts with praise and uh, his gates with praise and his courts with reverence. Thanksgiving, praise and all of that. So you need to be a worshiper. It is your worship that brings you, admits you into the presence of God. So you need to be a worshiper. If you must come and reason with him, you must be a worshiper. You must be a thanker. You must appreciate. Number three thing we need to note is that the lawyer speaks from a point of knowledge and not from emptiness. When a lawyer appears before a judge, he speaks from a point of knowledge and not from emptiness. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says that when you study the word of God, you will not face shame. A workman not needing to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. A lawyer who reads a lot, who has read far and wide concerning his matter that he's coming before a judge for, oh, when he argues his case, you will love just listening to him or being a lawyer. So, the same way, you don't want to face shame, you don't want to appear short in your job. First Timothy 2.15 says that you got to study the word of God. Study it. You're coming before God to, to reason, to reason. Wherewith will be your reasoning if you do not know certain things that is going to call up uh, in your discussion? So wherewith will be your reasoning? So don't appear empty. Good lawyers do not appear empty. Daniel chapter 2 verse 22, another point to note, Daniel 2 22, another point to note on that, uh, 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 speak from a point of knowledge and not from emptiness, is that God will reveal all knowledge to him who dwells on his word. That's what that scripture is saying, Daniel 2 22. He says that he will, all knowledge belongs to God, he will reveal it to those who dwell on his word. You cannot know jack about God unless you dwell on his word. You cannot do anything about me unless you read my story, unless you read my account. You will know nothing. Another thing to note is that according to Joshua 1, 8, according to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, 
such a person who dwells on the word of God will be successful. He says, this uh, book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night and seek to do according to all that he says. And then by it, you shall have good success. So you want to be successful? Then you got to rely on the word. You want to be successful before the judge? You got to rely on the word. You got to know the word. Another thing to note is that you study the word of God and meditate on his word. When you do that, you will assuage your thirst. First of all, you have to have a thirst for success. Now, that thirst for success is what will drive you to want to read and know. When you do that, when you meditate, then you will have success. If I use myself as an example, there are certain skills I want to acquire, certain things I want to know, uh, uh, whether it be in, uh, in programming or whatever. What I do is I spend time reading far and wide, research Google, watch how to make it videos and all, and then I get that knowledge and I try it. And hey, I'm better off than where I was before. You see, I begin to succeed. I begin to succeed. And I know that's how man operates. So anything you want to know, you spend time researching it, meditating on it and all. And in this case, spiritual matters, to appear before God, to uh, uh, reason with him, what you need to do is to have thirst. A thirst for success. And then that test for success leads you to meditating on his word. And as long as you meditate on his word, you will not be, uh, uh, you will not uh, have failure, you will have success, you will not be ashamed, and so on and so forth. So, uh, uh, the lawyer speaks from a point of knowledge and not from emptiness. What else can we copy from that uh, uh, scenario of uh, a lawyer before a judge, I give in a case? The lawyer relies on precedence. Precedence is a very important word in law. The lawyer relies on precedence. That is, past successful and standing judgments to argue his case. Remember that man, in his ability to reason, relies on experiences acquired over time, and then he strings them together to determine at each point in time, uh, or to weigh or to reason out at each point in time what needs to be done and what needs not to be done, what is reasonable, what is uh, unreasonable, what is right or what is wrong, what is good or what is evil. So the same way law works, it relies on precedence because once something goes right once, then you can rely on it for the next one. It's called precedence in law. A case has been tried in a certain way and comes out with a certain result, then any other similar case can rely on that, even without having, uh, 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 can rely on that expressly without having to be retried because it has occurred before. So this word precedence is very important in law and it is important in this reasoning with God, coming to reason with God, answering that invitation. Now, why is it so important? It's so important because God supplies all the precedents that you need. All the precedents that you need, God supplies them. You don't have to work for anything. God will supply the precedents that you need. Because it's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all knowledge belongs to Him. So He will supply the precedents that you need. Luke chapter 4 verse 4. Luke chapter 4 verse 4 points out, or points to the fact that the word of God is written, therefore it is not contestable. It is written, it is documented. It is written because it is true. It is not contestable. So you see, you can rely on this God who will supply your precedence. So the word of God that is really written, remember in our earlier point we said you meditate on it, you read it so that you will know it, so that you are not ashamed, you won't suffer shame. And it is written. Because it is written, you can quote it. Jesus quoted it to Satan. When Satan said to him in the wilderness, turn this stone to bread, Jesus said to him, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every living word that comes out of the mouth of God. So that uh, means that it is not contestable because the moment Jesus said it, Satan crawled away with his tail between his legs. 
So the word of God, another point to note here, or sub point, is that the word of God has precedence over every other word or article. The word of God has precedence over every other word or any other article. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, and not by bread alone. You see, this is what Jesus told Satan is written. So when Jesus was saying it is written, he was quoting, he was using precedence that had been provided by God. The same way we can use that same precedence. So when Jesus said to say that it is written, he was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 for him. So Jesus knew it because he had studied the scripture, meditated on it, and he knew, he, he knew this truth and he knew he could quote it because it's precedence. And he won that case against Satan. So the same way you can use this, you can rely on it, that, well, the science may say what it says about some things, man may say what he says about some things based on his, on his limited experiences, uh, other people's experiences may have brought forth to so result and all, but hey, what is all that before, when they are placed uh, uh, before God, this word says that, forget that, that this happened to Mr. X or Mrs. X in such a way and has happened to five other people in that way. Yes, man by his experiences will begin to think that that is how things will run. But God is saying, no, do not rely on that bread because that's bread, but rely on the living word that comes out of my mouth. And the living word of God, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, is the word of God, the 66 canonized books of the Holy Bible, the living word, according to John chapter 6, verse 63, John 6, 63, the words I speak to you, their spirit, their life, they can move, they can travel, they have power, and so on, and so forth. So you see, God supplies the precedence that you need. How wonderful is this? He supplies the precedence. The very judge <laughs> supplies the precedence. How are you going to lose your case? You cannot. And then, moving for, 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 forward from there, uh, another point I want to make is that God supplies all your witnesses. He supplies all the precedents you need. Then he also supplies all your witnesses. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. He supplies your witnesses because in a court, witnesses are important. In the trial of any matter, witnesses are important. The witness account. So how does God supply this? He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, he says, This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Do you know why God used men to document certain events? That is the Bible as we know it today. And also today in the testimonies that we give, our experiences. You know why God is doing that? Because he's using us as witnesses. Each time you testify of God's work, wonderful works in your life, you are witnessing, you are witnessing, you are witnessing, you are a witness. Each time you share the good news of Jesus, how he has brought salvation to you, what are you doing? You are a witness to his good works. You are providing the required evidence for this case to move forward. So God provides, the, supplies the witnesses, all the witnesses that you will need. And then the last point I want us to look at there or consider is that uh, when you are filled with the word, you will be able to release the word to work for your situation. So when a lawyer has all this knowledge in him. He opens his mouth when it's his, when it's his time to 
to stand to speak and he speaks the words out. If he never speaks those words out, the judge will never hear it and he will never come into record or account or in consideration of that case. So you need to be filled with the word. You need to release the word so that the word will work for your situation. And that's what it means to come and reason with God, brothers and sisters. So in conclusion, in conclusion, beyond reasonable doubt, remember that as a topic. In conclusion, dear brothers, dear sisters, the invitation has been extended to you by God himself, not by man, by God himself. Come, Isaiah chapter uh, uh, 1 verse uh, 8 that we read says, Come, did I say chapter 8? Uh, yeah, chapter 1 verse 18, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. It says, Come now and let us reason together, say yet the Lord. So it is the Lord himself inviting you to come so that you both may reason together. He has not left you alone. Remember, he has not left you alone. He said, come, we will do it together. He's willing to walk at it with you. He's willing to change your experiences from the limited experiences of man to his own unlimited experiences. He's, he's willing to do that. You know, there are things God does for you or some things you see, some wonders of God that you see, and then you experience just blossoms or stretches. For example, I had a skin condition throughout my younger years in uh, high school, my undergraduate days in the university and all till I graduated, I had it on me. So on my arms, on my chest and also I couldn't wear short sleeves. So I was known for wearing long sleeves a lot. I couldn't wear short sleeves because those things were dots all over me. I've, I went to all manners of hospital, manners of doctors, skin doctors, uh, uh, what do they call the other ones, uh, allergy doc experts and all and all. Took all manners of medication, nothing. Until one day, just after I got born again, I walked into a branch of the Redeemed Christian Church of God then, and it was just one dingy, small-looking church. And there was this evening program going on. And the, the preacher that day, the, the man who was invited for that prayer program, just said, look, uh, whatever it is you believe or trust God for, pray about it now, he will do it for you. So I, I, I said, okay. And, you know, before he said I had shared testimonies, experiences and all, just to encourage us. So based on that, I said, okay, let, let, me, let me try. So... I kid him because I said, this man is speaking confidently. You know, I, I, you know, he's experienced God in certain ways. So what was he doing? Calling forth witnesses, issuing out precedence and all. So I relied on all of that and I put my case before God and prayed. And of course, I looked at my skin after praying. When I got home, the pain was still there. A week after, the pain was still there. But one day I just realized that, look, my skin is now different. I don't even know the hour or the minute it happened. And then that's how I'm wearing short sleeves. You notice I wear a lot of short sleeves now. I'm trying to catch up the long sleeves that, I mean, the short sleeves that I couldn't wear all those years. I'm now catching up. So, you see, my experience is different. And that's why there's the, the certain things that you tell me is not possible with God. I tell you it is, it, it, it is possible. Why? Because I have a different set of experiences because I've gone to reason with him. That night at that program, precedence was issued. Witnesses were called. That is by way of testimonies and all. And I went and reasoned with him. And he turned it, though it was as red as crimson, he turned it as white as snow. Though my skin had uh, things all over it, uh, he, he wiped it out and made it as, as smooth. So, are you willing to walk at it with him? He has promised you that he will change every fatal failure to outstanding success, every disgusting appearance to glorious beauty, 
and every despicable history to attractive story. So are you willing to be reasonable beyond your doubts? Are you willing to be reasonable beyond your doubts? That is what it is to go beyond the reasonable doubt with God. He says, come, let us reason beyond your reasonable doubts. He's saying your doubts are reasonable. They are reasonable. But there is something beyond that reasonable doubt. There is something totally, completely, and infinitely beyond that reasonable doubt. You only touch that when you come to God. So let's bow our heads now. And may I ask that if you don't have Jesus, because that's the very first thing you need. A lawyer cannot come before a judge to argue any case without first being called to the bar. Do you have Jesus? Are you qualified? So go ahead. If you want to be qualified to come before this judge, before this God, before this unlimited God, then go ahead and ask him to wash you with the blood of Jesus. Tell him that you acknowledge that Jesus was killed. He died on the cross for you. He resurrected on the third day. His blood was shed to wash you. He lived forevermore. So you are arising into a new life by virtue of that. Even as you go before him and ask for his forgiveness, tell him you are repentant of your sinful ways because you've been born in sin and then ask him to give you a new list to life write your name in the book of life go ahead and pray that prayer in jesus mighty name we have prayed can i ask that we all we all of us also pray whatever it is that you're trusting god for now that we have given our lives to him Whatever it is that you're trusting God for, remember you've now come to him to reason. So why don't you put that in before him like I did at that night, at that, and like I did that night at that program in that small redeemed church. Your experiences will change tonight. I believe so. So ask God for that. Don't worry yourself about how big or whatever, or it seems impossible the matter is. You are not God. When you begin to look at, will this be possible? This thing I want to ask for, it's too big. Is it possible? With man, it is impossible. With God, it is possible. So when you begin to ask, is it possible? Maybe it's not possible. That's your reasonable doubt. Yes, it is reasonable that a dead man cannot resurrect. Now, that's very reasonable because we've seen many dead people buried and prayers offered that nothing happened. But... Don't worry yourself about your reasonable doubt. Just come to God and reason. Over that matter that you want to happen, the way I prayed that night, very simple prayer, just pray it. Believe in all the cases, the precedents, all the witnesses you've had, even by the way of this service tonight, this Bible study tonight. Just go ahead and pray. The Lord will answer you. As he did it for me, I know he will do it for you. Somebody will have a testimony from this. Somebody is going to have a testimony. As I have that testimony, you will have that testimony. Because God is in the business of calling forth witnesses and testimonies come from witnesses. And let's begin to round up our prayers now. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Our Father and our Lord, we bless your name and thank you for this wonderful time to look into your word tonight. Thank you for the re revelations thereof. Accept our thanks in Jesus' name. For everyone, O oh Lord, that had answered your call tonight and given their lives to, unto you, O oh Lord, please receive them, wash them with the blood of Jesus, qualify them, O oh Lord, to be before you, to stand as sons before you, empower them, O oh Lord, to call on your name and have result. Father, right, uh, admit them into your kingdom and let it be well with them in the mighty name of Jesus. And for everyone that has prayed tonight, O oh Lord, by way of faith, O oh Lord, by way of coming to reason with you, Father, please answer them in Jesus' name. As you answered me, O oh Lord, that night in uh, 1997 in that uh, uh, redeemed church, Father, answer them also in the mighty name of Jesus. Answer them, Lord. Answer them. Answer them expressly in the mighty name of Jesus. And let it be well with each and every one of them. Let testimonies come forth, O Lord. 
in the mighty name of Jesus. Glory be to your mighty name. In Jesus' wonderful name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let somebody who knows that his testimony is coming shout a really big hallelujah. Thank you for being part of this Bible study tonight. Let me remind us again that uh, we are to give our offering, pay your tithe, your vows, support our building fund, the account numbers we put on the screen. Please do so. It's unto God you are giving and not unto man. And uh, please uh, follow us on our channels, on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Mixella Radio. Like us there, subscribe, help us so that our subscriber base will grow. It will help us do more things easier and get the word more to you. And God will bless you as you do so. Don't forget to share the link with friends and family. And then on Thursday, that is in two days' time, we'll be meeting on these channels again for our prayer time, very effective prayer time. And I know that God will answer you as you join. Also invite people to join. So I'll see you on Thursday, 7 p.m. Thank you for joining. God bless you and bye-bye.